Welcome to Build. I'm Laura Haywood, and I hope you've got your dancing shoes on because I have one of Broadway's hottest choreographers with me today. Spencer Liff is here. You've seen his work on nine seasons of So You Think You Can Dance, for which he's been nominated for multiple Emmys. He's choreographed for a ton of TV's most popular sitcoms, including Parks and Rec and How I Met Your Mother. And his Broadway credits include such diverse and beloved works as Hedwig and the Angry Inch, Falsettos, and Deaf West's Spring Awakening. I'm really excited to dig into Spencer's newest project, too, choreography for the brilliant new musical Head Over Heels, featuring the legendary music of the Go-Go's. Spencer and I will get talking very soon. First, let's take a look at this trailer for Head Over Heels. hear that music without starting to dance along and dance and sing. So it's perfect for a musical. Uh, what was your first exposure to the music of the Go-Go's, Spencer? Um, well, I definitely heard it um, from my mom. She was a, you know, she was a big fan and I wasn't born until the 80s. So uh -huh. it wasn't, it wasn't in my life, you know, as a teenager, the way that it was the people that were a generation above me. But I think that that allowed me to sort of put my own you know, vibe to it and and make it basically new, fresh music um, mm -hmm. for, for those that are experiencing it for the first time now. It's so, so danceable. I can only imagine it's a choreographer's dream. Well, everything has a, a huge driving pulse of a beat in it, and that is what I choreograph to. My favorite instruments are the guitar and the drums. It's what I'm always drawn to in any track. So it, it is a plenty in this music, I will tell you. Cool. So for people who haven't heard about Head Over Heels, which I should say opens on Broadway tomorrow. Yes, I'm so happy excited. Happy almost <laughs> opening. Um, how do you, and I think as we saw in the clip, it's this kind of unexpected mashup of a story that uh, was originally written in the 1500s mm -hmm. and this music that became popular in the 1980s yeah. and a, so a story that feels really current while still having, you know, like this Elizabethan era language. Um, can you describe what Head Over Heels is uh, in addition to being this amalgam of unexpected um, qualities? Yeah, well, it definitely, um, we joke, it should not work on paper. It <laughs> definitely, when you read it, you think there's there's no way that's weird, and whoever thought of that is crazy. But I think well, crazy, I wouldn't argue that. I just crazy think it's is good. Yeah, it's great. Um, and, you know, we were, con the, the concept was conceived by Jeff Whitty, who wrote Avenue Q. So right there, you know that that is a, a brain that thinks outside the box. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, at its heart, we're oddly able to sort of explore an ideal future by looking at the past. And so many of these themes were actually in this novel that was written in 1585, which I think is funny. It's music is, you know, 1985, in the mm -hmm. early 1980s. And, and <laughs> there was a lot of these Shakespearean themes in this, you know, and actually Shakespeare's took a lot of, of his themes from Arcadia, which was written prior, you know, the cross-dressing and, um, you know, there was even the lesbian themes were in there. Um, so I think that it's kind of incredible that we can put something on stage now that has a ton of female empowerment, that has a ton of, you know, finding your, your truest self, finding maybe a multi-gendered being within you, and by doing so, you can find your own confidence and find your own happiness. Um, those, I think, are very topical 
points at the moment, but we're able to do so while also providing two hours of pure escapism and totally. a really, really freaking great time in the theater. Yeah. It is uh, it is a f- feast for all of the senses, I have to say. like the I like the logo because the huge pops of brilliant color are really evocative of the whole theme of the show. The whole, um, the, the staging is gorgeous. The sets are amazing. The costume design is fantastic. And the cast members, and even like their makeup design, yeah. everything pops. Well, a lot of people don't know. If you saw Hedwig, this is the entire team that brought you Hedwig. Oh, great. So it's the same set designer, costume designer, lighting designer, sound designer, d- director, and myself. So it was our second outing. And, you know, Hedwig was very in your face and was very color- colorful. And and we're able to sort of, in a very new aesthetic, bring you those same elements. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Michael Mayer, who who is a genius at these mashups, he brought you Spring Awakening, the first one. It's funny, I did the revival after him, but Michael and I have very similar taste, obviously. We both did Hedwig, we both done a Spring Awakening, and now we have this. But I knew and so trusted that his eye would be able to figure out how to make this piece work. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and in our scenes, we're very... Yeah, all of our sets are painted flat. Everything that we have in the show basically would have had to exist in these Tudor times of these Elizabethan times of putting on plays. So everything is a painted flat drop. And then when the music starts, the projections kick in and the whole set just like pops to life. And we go to this like crazy fantasy music video place, which is also the part where I really right. jump in and and are able to choreograph these huge production numbers really um, using all kinds of different styles of dance, uh, you know, everything from very technical ballet and jazz to more of the queer club style dancing that Mm -hmm. was around when I was a teenager sinking into clubs in New York City in the 90s and and been able to find a place to mash all that together into this style of dancing that that I have deemed this like Arcadian, this Arcadian style. Yeah. Did you have to work with the costume designer to find uh, ways to get this? I mean, I imagine that some of those corseted looks would be very difficult to dance in. Did you guys collaborate? We did. Well, Ariane and I um, had done Hedwig already together. Um, and Ariane has designed almost everything that Madonna has done for like 30 years. She's her, her stylist. The and, cone and, bra? And her, I believe the cone bra was her, wow. her real, which is, <laughs> we have that reference in our show yeah. on Amazon. But she had, has done so many of Madonna's tours, so she knows how to costume dancers. Mm-hmm. But what I did do is, after I cast my ensemble, I had a character for each of them in mind. I knew which one was my, you know, my pretty Barbie girl. And which was my tough one, and there was two characters that I wanted to be twins. And and so I sat down with her, and I showed them each of the pictures of the ensemble, and I said, this is who I think they are. And and she was able to riff off of that and really create a unique voice for each of the ensemble members. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was a battle between, like, how big can the sleeves be? How, you know, how tight can the corset be? Um, but... But she knew that this was a giant dance show, and she she w- didn't want to stand in the way of of legs kicking to the ceiling. Right, good, and, I'm, and we're all glad that she didn't do that. The talent in this show on that stage is so ridiculous, and the number of people making their Broadway debuts, like Bonnie Milligan and Peppermint, I think just shines so bright. I'm like, where? has the Broadway industry been that these two incredible women have not been showcased until now on the big stage? Well, part of that is because these roles were not available. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Peppermint's the first trans woman to originate a leading role on Broadway. She is, and we, you know, we had to search hard to find to find someone that could that could sing dance and act and have that star charisma and there aren't very many trans performers that are at that level because mm-hmm. there haven't been the roles available you have Laverne Cox to choose from and now we have Pose and all those incredible actresses that are on that show but I'm hoping now that more people will see like Oh, I could be successful at that. There will be a role for me. I'm gonna pursue this seriously. So that that's very exciting. But by design, this whole show wanted to feel fresh. And so I went out of my way to find dancers that had not been on Broadway before. I saw over six hundred people for the eight roles. And wow. it took me months and months and months of auditioning. And and I think over half of them are making their Broadway debut. And it just brings this, you know, extra little bit of excitement and energy to your work when you have people in the room that are are fresh and move in a different way. It makes me want to create something that hasn't been seen before. This certainly is that, and in all the best ways. 
Let's go way back in time. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, you started performing at a very young age. I, you were seven when you went on tour with Will yeah, Rogers I got my Follies. Equity card at seven years old. I am obsessed with the story of your audition for that show. I would love for you to share it. All right. Well, I flew, um, I flew to New York City with my mom, and they were having an open call on stage of the Palace Theater. And I uh, had been obsessed with the Chorus Line movie and watched it every day. And so I sang I Can Do That, and I choreographed my own little dance break with a back handspring. And I wore a little unitard like they did in the movies, because mm -hmm. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And at the end of my first audition, Tommy Toon came up to me and he said, you know, you're really great and we're going to give you a call back, which means you're going to come back tomorrow and dance, but you can just wear regular boy clothes. You don't have to wear the <laughs> unitard. And I was so upset because I loved my unitard. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we, we made Also, sure who just, says what makes a regular boy? I know. Well, it was a different time. Of course. Um, and I could just imagine Tommy Doon is so long Towering and leggy. Over me and I, was I don't know how tall you were at that moment, but I can just imagine you being like, yes, sir. Um, Tommy Toon came to the show the other night, and it was <gasps> crazy to see him after after all this time. Wow. I have a picture with him, and I do came I came up to his knees at the time uh, from opening night. So I used to watch him, though, in the wings, and I'd watch him direct these beautiful 30 women up a staircase with these gorgeous costumes on and and just watching him basically like paint with his mind with all these people that would listen to him and do whatever he said and I I knew that I wanted to be able to create on that scale and do that um and the kids on the playground just would not listen to me in the same <laughs> way and so I was like I gotta grow up and do this for real so you became a performer first uh making your Broadway debut at the ripe old age of 11 yes 10 Oh, sorry, 10. I think when we opened, I was 10. And in, this was in big? Yeah, it was 19, yeah, 1995, 96, the season of Rent. Uh, uh -huh. so was, imagine being in your first Broadway show as a little kid and like being at all those press events and things with the original cast of Rent. It was insane. Is it true that you, um, when you were off stage during big, that you would be listening to Rent in your dressing oh, room? Oh, we performed Rent in our dressing room in between the scenes of doing our own show, which we thought, like doing our own Broadway show was not cool enough. We just all dreamt that we were going to grow up and, and be in Rent. And uh, I know at least one of them, Enrico Rodriguez played Angel for years when he grew up. But Aww. um but most of us, it's funny, every single boy in that show, all of us were young, every single boy is still performing. They're still on Broadway. Wow. Um, Who else was in it with you? Uh, Brandon Espinosa is in SpongeBob now, but he's done 20 shows. And Joseph Medeiros is, I think, in Book of Mormon now. Um, but it just, you know, it shows that you, know, you, we had so much passion for it when we were younger, and, and it never dwindled. And, and the kids in that show were remarkable that, we were expected to be, I mean, doing a new musical is crazy. You learn new production numbers every night. You have to do them that night perfectly in front of an audience, learn a new song and a new dance number the other day, Susan, or the next day. Susan Stroman was our choreographer, and you could not mess up a step. Yeah, it you, don't get, you don't get bigger than and, that. But it was heaven as a 10-year-old. And again, I would watch her create, and we would have, Big had a lot of problems um, that, you know, we had to fix massive structural problems and we're constantly changing things and I was always doing it in my head like oh this dance break should go here and mm -hmm. this song isn't working and if they flip these things and so I just knew then that I was going to be doing it and then you went on a few years later to work with Rob Ashford who's another one of the great director choreographers and is it true that you were working with him as an actor and he wanted to bring you on for another project and you were like can I please be your assistant choreographer yeah he um I did The Wedding Singer with him. That's right. It was my first show as an adult. I think it was 19, maybe. Um, and I, I loved how he worked, and I loved his relationship with his then-associate, Joanne Hunter, who is now her own fabulous choreographer. And Joanne was going off to start choreographing on her own, and I... I knew that I'd learned so much from him. So yes, I said, I will dance in your next show, but I want to be your assistant. And he gave me a shot in the workshop. It was the workshop of Crybaby. And he oh, basically amazing said, that you like, advocated for yourself in that way. You, you have to. No one's going to do it for you. Yeah. So you always have to ask for what you want, and you always have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I knew I'd be a great assistant for him. Um, and I I think I did it with you know for no pay at the time. I said, let me just take on the the role, I'll come in early. I'll help you with the pre-production. I'll do the auditions for free, all of that. And then after the workshop, I was signed, sealed, and delivered, and did everything with him for about three years. That included getting to be the associate choreographer for the Oscars several times, and the Kennedy Center Honors, and the Tony Award opening numbers, and, and just starting to learn how to do things on that scale. 
when you made your transition into television, there are a couple of stories that I'm obsessed with. I really um, like to dig deep in. Uh, oh, your research is very story. thorough. It's scary. <laughs> I like to dig deep into the stories of um, how opportunity is often not enough, and it's the hard work both to get to the opportunity and then to seize the opportunity when the moment comes. Um, I think a lot of times people from the outside will look at a career and be like, "Oh, he was so lucky," you know. When you got the opportunity to submit yourself for So You Think You Can Dance, you didn't just, and they said, send us a video. You didn't just like self-tape, a, a, um, you know, like a, a routine. Yeah. You went the extra mile. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I had one shot to march into So You Think You Can Dance. They were in their fifth season. I had been an avid fan of the show. I had never choreographed anything on my own, but I was in LA being the associate choreographer of the Oscars. I was there for a couple weeks. My manager had one shot of getting somebody in the room to meet with them. So I went in, guns blazing. I want to do this. I'm going to change the Broadway category. These are all my ideas. And they, they didn't laugh me off, but they said, okay, you haven't really ever done anything. Mm -hmm. And why don't you go home and make a demo tape. So I did, I came back to New York and I was on a chorus boy salary at the time. You don't have a lot of money, but I had been saving up for a vacation fund and I took that money and I hired a camera crew and I hired dancers and we rehearsed the crap out of them and I came up with exactly what I wanted to do. And then I took the graphics from the show and I put it on the tape and I did an interview and I did the rehearsal package and I basically produced my own segment of the show and sent it in. And the producer said that not one person in the five years of the, the show running had ever done that. And and that they knew that even though I was young and hadn't done anything, that I really understood the show. Mm -hmm. And so they called and they said, you're going to be on in three days. Pack your bags, <laughs> you're coming to LA. Jeez. And I instantly felt like I was going to vomit because I thought, oh crap, I got myself here. But like, I'm about to be on the biggest dance TV show and it'll be the first thing that I ever really choreographed that anyone will see on my own. And, and it was terrifying. I flew out... Um, and they sort of micromanaged what I was going to do. They mm -hmm. told me my song, and they, they, they didn't let me make a lot of the choices. And then I got two dancers that were not in my style. I got a, a Latin ballroom dancer and a hip-hop dancer who could spin on his head really well, but do Fosse not so much. <laughs> and you only get six hours to choreograph your number, and it's a pressure cook cooker. And the number went live on TV, and it sucked. And I sat there and got critiqued and got my heart like crushed that I'd finally made this and it was supposed to be this huge shot and everybody in New York was so happy for me and was there, was back here watching it happen live. And, and the show ended and I grabbed my manager and I cried for about two minutes and I wiped off my tears and I marched back into the producer's office and I was like, this is why it didn't go right. This is what I wanted to be doing. This is what I would do differently next week. And this is one of those moments of opportunity. Um, Tice, who was supposed to do the show the next week, was having a family emergency and couldn't. And they had a very last second spot and the producer said all right I'll give you one more shot and I stood strong and said I'm gonna do it how I want to do it and uh I got two great dancers one of them was Eleanor Scott who is now my associate all these years later I love that um but I I had them the best number of the night that week mm -hmm. and that sort of I went from the worst to the best and they had me on the next week and then the next season and next season and nine years later, I'm still there. Yeah, and in fact, right after opening night of Head Over Heels, you're heading right back into your 10th season. I know. They start episodes. I think they started live episodes last night, or maybe the live is on Monday, but then I'll jump back in for season number 10, which was never supposed to happen. I mean, the fact that that show has been able to hold strong and still has this incredibly dedicated fan base, um, and that we as choreographers are allowed to present like almost anything that we can think of in our heads, you then have this amazing team of costume designers and lighting designers and people that just make it happen for you every single week. Mm -hmm. And there's no job that I'll ever have that will be quite as special as, as that show. The, do you, there are a lot of Broadway performers that have come through that show. Yeah. Do you have a special relationship with them? Do you guys give each other like a nod and a wink when you see well, we them at events? Well, we each other. Yeah. I mean, they're like... It's fun when you have someone as a contestant and you see them in that in that level. But what it really is is that we're we're hiring those kids because we know they can cut it. They're mm -hmm. in a huge pressure cooker being on that show. So if I had a bunch of kids in an audition and I know someone from So You Think You Can Dance and they performed live flawlessly week after week, I of course I'm going to hire them to be either on the live TV show like the Oscars or on a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it's, you know, you have to make the choice in life, either whether you want to be an L.A. dancer, whether you want to dance for an artist like Pink and go on tour mm-hmm. around the world, or if you want to come to New York. And I, I hold a special place in my heart for the ones and the, and the contestants that have come to New York and been very successful. I mean, half the Newsies cast was made up of So You Think You Can Dance Boys. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Melanie Moore, um, Neil Haskell, all these people. Ariana DeBose. Yeah, well, gosh, now she's a Tony nominee. And what's funny is she was like, I think she was first kicked off her season. She was like, she didn't make it that far. Uh, you know, she's like the Jennifer Hudson of, of <laughs> So You Think You Dance. Like, didn't make it that far, and look look at her now. She was <laughs> here, um, and we talked about that journey. Uh, and um, at the very end of, of one of the clips, she looks right into camera, and she goes, uh, to my future self, you're going to end up somewhere amazing. <laughs> and I was like, well, she was right. She's, I mean, she's, she's driven. She yeah. made it happen for herself. Uh, so you are a full-time choreographer now, but you dipped your toe back into performing to, get, to go to Chorus Line at the, at the Hollywood Bowl, which I love because yes. I know that that little boy in, was, the, in his unitard. I didn't like, get, well, the thing is, I didn't get the Broadway revival. I, right? I auditioned for it nine times. I didn't get it. And it was the only time as an adult I've ever cried over not getting a role Aww. because I loved that show so much. And it, funny enough, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be because had I like had I done that show, I wouldn't have done Wedding Singer. I wouldn't have then done the Hairspray movie. All these other things that happened that were part of who I am now. But it's hard to see those things at the time, and I was just crushed. Um, and w- when I retired from performing, one of the biggest regrets was that I never got to do that show. So it came about at the Hollywood Bowl. I, I called my manager, the same manager. By the way, I've had her since she's represented me since I was nine years old. So you Whoa! Can, like, that is a, it's a long-standing relationship. But I called her and I said, "You're gonna laugh so hard at me, but I really want to be in chorus line. Do you think you can get me an audition? Do you mm-hmm. think they'd see me for it?" And I like go and get my audition book, and I'm starting to dust off what song I'm gonna sing, and I'm nervous. And she called me back like an hour later, and she said, "They'll offer you the part of Larry if you'd like it." And I was like, <laughs> "Yes, I'll do it." Wow, um, straight to the offer. I well, you know, it's like Larry's the assistant choreographer of the show. I'm like, I think I can handle playing that, and um, and they remembered me from all those auditions, mm-hmm. and they, you know, they said in the end, they were like, "You weren't right for the show." I, you know. I, and it wasn't my time, but I got to do it in front of 17,000 people for three nights in a row. And it was kind of hard not to cry, like finally getting to take that off my bucket list. And I got taught the show privately from Bayark in who, you know, in my own studio because everyone else had done the show already. Oh, so she wow. spent like two days alone with me and taught me with all the stories passed down through all the years, taught me the show exactly how it was meant to be done. And that was pretty special. And now you you get to do that with projects like Head Over Heels. You get to to bring in new generations of of talent, teach them, and and then perhaps they'll go on to to spread that talent. And forty years from experience. now, the, the, the Head <laughs> Over Heels. You'll be the Tommy Toon in the in their story. <laughs> you know, I, it's I mentoring is such a huge part. I think of of being in this business, and you know, dance is not something that can be can be written down. You know, you can film it now, but but being taught in a room in that time that you spend with your dancers is is sacred to me. Um, and there's, uh, you know, a bunch of people in the generation above me who did work with all all the greats, you know, Robbins and Bennett and Fosse. And if they don't share their stories with us and we can't pass them on, then those things will die. Mm. Um, and that that shouldn't happen because it's it's legendary. Yeah, let's take up uh, let's take a couple questions from our audience. I'm nervous. Don't be nervous. They all, they're here because they love you. <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to say I feel your passion for your art, for your dance. Uh, I am actually from Canada, but uh, I'm a dance mom, not a dancer. So my daughter danced full time when she was going through her dance yep. years. But we found out about the opening night of your show, and we bought tickets. So we're going to be there tomorrow night. <laughs> What can we expect from an opening night? Because we've never been to an opening night of a show. Well, the energy is unlike anything else. Um, the cast has worked you know, long and hard. I've been working on this show for two years. A lot of the cast has been on for that long as well. So you think about all that passion. And, and then on top of that, there's 
like 10 Broadway debuts in the in the company. So even though we've been playing previews, I don't count it as your true Broadway debut until your show officially opens. So all those dreams and goals you will get to see realized. And, um, you know, we have lots of fun, special celebrities that'll be in the house. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, it's just a party night. And um, I, I, there's nothing like it. And you'll get your special playbill that says opening night on it. And <laughs> you oh could say that Yeah, forever. those are collect- so. highly collectible. Also, um, the I love fashions at an opening night. So keep your eyes open, especially for a show like this that uh, that has such bold colors no, and so and much sparkle. I think we've sparkle. got some fun drag star contestants coming to support Peppermint. So we should see some fun people in the audience. I would want to be sitting behind someone in the giant wig, but... <laughs> I'm excited to see who shows up. My very first question is, so what should I wear? Well, I would say wear something that's fun, sparkly, and 80s. Okay. (laughs) Great advice. (laughs) I am. (laughs) Uh, So I was wondering how 80s music and style affected your choreography for the new show. It's a great question. Um, I, in the beginning, I really wanted to veer away from anything that was like a royal court dance like you would have seen in Elizabethan time. And I wanted to veer away from anything that had like a funny 80s connotation to it. I did The Wedding Singer, which was an 80s show, and we did all those moves and they make people laugh and you don't really like take it necessarily seriously now. So I didn't do any of that for a while. And then uh, I had studied all of these Renaissance paintings and things to make this show come to life. And all of that angles and the poses that they were doing just sort of reminded me of voguing and that began to find find its way into the show and in then that weird backwards way I found my 80s dancing it just wasn't necessarily the more mainstream style so I play on the tutting and the voguing and and what was going on in the ballroom scene slightly mixed with other styles but I think that's the only touch of 80s that I have in the show. Do you ever watch the show and like want to get up there and be on stage or are you happy in your uh creative role off stage. I get incredibly self-conscious dancing my own steps. It's really weird. I just saw you do it on your Instagram story. I know, story. and I was, like, petrified of it. <laughs> well, you looked amazing. But, it, like, dancing someone else's work is fine. Like, I've never loved doing my own stuff, and I've ended up in my own shows, like, in an emergency situation. I've ended up on So You Think You Could Dance the day of because a dancer's gotten injured. Uh-huh. Um, but it... It's weird. When I create, I create for the bodies that I have in front of me and for mm. other people. Now, I will say that this is exactly, this is my, would be my dream show as a dancer. And mm. I think it is the dream show of the dancers I hired. It, you know, it's such a unique style and they're so up front and center and, and the ensemble gets celebrated so much in this show. So th- that being said, if I, if I had to do another Broadway show, um, this would be exactly what I'd wish I could do. Cool. Well, um, we are going to have the ladies of Head Over Heels coming in soon. So stay tuned for more information about that. We have time for one more audience question. Hi. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you could elaborate on kind of the differences between uh, choreographing theater and choreographing film and TV. That's an awesome, awesome question. Um, You have so much more control on TV because I can point that camera to exactly what I want to see. I can put it low to make somebody look like they're jumping high. I can stack people up. I can... I know exactly what what is going to be shown at the end. Um, on stage, you have to know that any audience member could look anywhere they want at any time. And while it is your job to try to focus the eye where you think it should be, it's more about making sure every single detail, whether they be in the back row, in the corner, or you know wherever, is you know is f- is fulfilled. And then the second part is that TV is often very short. You're doing a two minute number. Or, you know, on a sitcom, a 30-second little dance bit. And it's like, how do I pack in as much as possible into a 90-second So You Think You Can Dance number? As opposed to a piece of theater, which will span two hours, and you're thinking about a choreographic arc to take you on a journey. So those are my two main differences. It is so great to see that you have made this career for yourself that allows you to do both. Because I think in so many cases, people are forced to choose television or theater, West Coast or East Coast. And here you are having really dominated both fields. You're at the top of your game. We get to see your work on television. We get to go go to the theater and see these incredible, joyful dancers bringing your vision to life. Um, I, it's so great to be able to talk to you and hear your stories. Well, thank you. I will say about that. People want you to have to choose because people want to put you in a box. Mm -hmm. They, in all aspects of life. People expect you to be a certain thing. And I am all about 
breaking that mold. And so many of the choices that I've made have been doing a project that I'm terrified of or that I know I'm going to learn something, whether it be I have to learn sign language to choreograph sign language. Right, we didn't even get into that. Or work. I mean, whatever it's been, it's all about like dodging what people would expect of mm -hmm. me. And in doing so, I continue to like find myself fulfilled by learning more. Um, and I keep making the choices of going back and forth between LA and New York. It makes things hard with a personal life. It makes things hard mm -hmm. with keeping apartments and friends and, and significant others. But I am very happy and fulfilled by the work I get to do and will continue to, to do it all, hopefully. <laughs> well, definitely, I could have talked to you for hours. I hope you'll come back and visit us again. So There's cool. so much it. more to get into, um, but we have to end it there just purely for time reasons. Spencer Liff, you're a, you're a gift to the performing thank arts. Thank you so much, and thank you guys for coming. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you.